Perfect. Uh, so it is my honor to, to introduce you today, Dr. David Benrimo. Uh, Dr. David Benrimo is a psychiatry resident and researcher at McGill University and the chief science officer at IFRED Health. David completed his medical studies at McGill and has a, math, has a master in neuroscience with a focus on computation at UCL. Uh, he is an author on over 20 peer-reviewed publications and focuses on the exciting field of computational psychiatry. Previously founder of a successful nonprofit focused on public representation and healthcare decision making, David spends his time blending research, advocacy, patient care, and entrepreneurship with the goal of comprehensively advancing the state of mental health care. David, I turn it over to you. Sure, can you all see my screen? Perfect. Great. Um, I realize I don't have my usual disclosure slide in here because I adapted this from a presentation that's meant to be snappy and short. So disclosure, um, I am a shareholder and founder of a for Health and therefore everything I say to you is a terrible lie aimed at making, my, making me and my colleagues money. So you can ignore everything I say, go home and you'll be better off for it. And now for the talk. Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our work using artificial intelligence for personalized clinical decision support in depression. And this is work that we do at my startup, AFRIT Health, um, which we kind of run as much as possible, uh, or at least we used to before we you know, had investors to please, uh, as our own little research lab, which produces lots of papers and cool models and things. Um, and um, the, uh, the real uh, sort of uh, work we do is around improving the state of personalized clinical decision support for patients with de depression. And we are one of the, uh, the top 10 finalists in the IBM Watson AI X Prize, which is a global competition of teams trying to build solutions for AI for good. Um, I, AI used for things other than targeted advertising or killer robots. Uh, the first of those being much more dangerous than the latter. Um, and um, the, uh, this is a sort of an adaptation of a talk I gave uh, as part of that competition uh, a, a while back. Um, so that, I do have my disclosure slide. There we go. Perfect. It was there. So let's talk a little bit about depression. So obviously, you know, something we hear a lot about today um, and people ask what it is and what it means. And is it just be being sad? And no, it's not just being sad. It's a lot of things, but what it is really is um, the, 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 the act of having real difficulty engaging in and enjoying life um, in addition to, to, to being quite sad. Um, and I like to think a bit uh, about it as a filter all the information coming into your brain kind of gets filtered and turned negative. Um, and also information within your brain. So the way you think about yourself, the way you think about other people, the way you think about the world around you becomes negative. Um, and as doctors, you know, uh, and psychologists and social workers and other mental health care professionals, uh, we try to help uh, them find their way, but this is a very difficult task. And it's a difficult task for some reasons that I'll explain. I'll tell a little, a little story to illustrate this of a patient of mine called Frank. So Frank was a man who uh, on the surface initially had everything. He had his own business, he had a loving family, he had grandchildren, he had everything uh, that you know traditionally you're supposed to have, want or have. Um, we can ask questions about whether or not the traditional way of wanting or having things is good or not. But traditionally speaking, and he was a very traditional man, he had all the things that he was supposed to have. But he got depressed. Um, and this depression, this depression lasted nine long years. It took nine years of trying almost every treatment in the book, um, and some that were only recently added to the book, um, before he was able to recover, before he was able to get back to uh, himself and to be able to re-engage with, uh, with his family, with his life. Um, I was very lucky uh, in that I was a medical student at the time when Frank was recovering, and I met him at that point, uh, nine years after his initial depression. And I was struck by his story and by the fact that it took him that long um, to, to recover. And the interesting thing is that Frank is not alone. Um, the majority of patients have this experience, and the experience is what I like to call the treatment lottery. So we will, you know, get a patient, um, we'll try a treatment, that is effectively as if we are spinning uh, the, uh, the, um, the wheel on a, on a slot machine. 
and we hope to see if it works. And if it doesn't, then we try something else. And if it doesn't, we try something else. And if it doesn't, we try something else until either the patient gets better, gives up, um, or uh, you know, a terrible thing like suicide happens, unfortunately, in too many cases. But um, the, the truth of the matter is that most patients have to go through this very, very difficult process of trying to something and, and seeing if it works and trying something else and seeing if it works before they get better. Um, and this is really a, a, a phenomenon that is, uh, that is consistent across patients. So a third of patients will find relief after the first treatment, which if that was antibiotics, we'd all be going crazy over, right? If, if only a third of the time I gave you a medication for, you know, a urinary, a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia, if only a third of the time that worked, um, people would not be okay with that situation because that's a very low, um, low uh, rate of initial successful treatment. Uh, about another third find relief after four treatments. Um, and this is four separate trials of treatment. Um, so four different medications or psychotherapy add-on or what have you. Um, and other patients have to keep trying and keep looking. Um, and this is a very, very difficult situation because, you know, um, one in nine people will experience depression over the course of their lives. It's a bit higher um, in, uh, in Western countries, potentially because of uh, reporting bias or because of better sampling techniques or what have you. Um, but globally, it's one in nine. So this is not at all um, a condition that only exists in the West. This is globally, um, and this is 320 million people at any given time across the planet. That's like the entire population in the United States, basically, is depressed at any given time around the world. It's a lot of people. Um, it is the number one cause of disability on the planet. So bar none, it, is, it causes more disability than back pain. It causes more disability than car accidents. It causes more disability than anything you can think of. Depression is number one. The other things are terrible as well and also cause a lot of disability, but depression recently took, took, took the number one spot because we've gotten really good at treating other things and less good at treating depression. Uh, it costs the US $210 billion a year and it costs the world probably around a trillion dollars a year depending on what number you look at. That's a lot of money in addition to a lot of suffering. Um, and you know, clearly there's a lot of scope to help improve this situation. So our challenge, and there's many challenges in the treatment of depression. I don't want to come off as saying that this is the only one. And once we solve this, it's all going to be done and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be finished. Um, but one problem is getting more patients better and doing it faster. Um, and the idea would be to short circuit this trial and error, trial and error, trial and error that doctors have to implement uh, by getting the patient the right treatment as early as possible. The problem with that is that people are complicated. So hopefully this still works, this animation. This is a really nice animation that, uh, oh yeah, it works. There we go, okay, good. So we have to put together a lot of different factors, family, sleep, work, appetite, different symptoms, their mood. Um, all of these things, we have to put them together in the complexity of the person and their specific situations, the goal of getting the patient to recovery. And all of these things interact in very complicated, heterogeneous ways that are not necessarily obvious for every person, because every person is unique. Um, our challenge is to take that complexity and to boil it down to um, inputs and outputs that appreciate the complexity of the person, but that give us actionable information that we can actually use to help people get better faster. Um, and I'm sure that some of you will recognize that this looks like a neural network. Um, and that's on purpose, obviously, because we're an AI company that uses neural networks. So the objective here really is to use a technique that can look for complex patterns in, uh, in people um, across thousands and thousands of patients and identify different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of patterns that will tell us something about response, not just in general, but to specific treatments. And uh, to have a, a system that actually appreciates the complexity uh, of the individual and that understands how all these different factors play against each other. Because it's not just the case where there's one kind of depression and they should all respond the same way. We think there are different kinds of depression from a biological standpoint and whatever biological subtype of, subtype of depression you have probably interacts significantly with your environment and your family situation and your social situation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which 
makes it difficult to necessarily know which treatment, whether it be drugs or psychotherapy or what have you, is gonna be most effective in your particular situation. So how it works, how the AFRID solution works is if I was seeing Frank today, instead of guessing a treatment, um, I'd have him answer a simple questionnaire. So we made the decision early on not to go after genetics or other complicated things like um, you know, using your phone to, to track your activity um, for two reasons. Firstly, a lot of those things are very exciting, but very new and don't have established science yet. So um, there's been meta-analyses about trying to predict treatment response using or to predict other things using in depression, using uh, you know, phone activity, for example. And at the end of the day, the meta-analysis said that there's no clear signal and it's, it's too early. Same thing for EEG. And for pharmacogenetics, we have some signal, there's some benefit to it, but cost benefit wise, it probably isn't there yet um, in terms of the amount of remission you get uh, with the expense that it costs. Um, and most people who, um, who get a pharmacogenetic test have to pay for it out of pocket because very few insurance companies cover it and very few governments cover it as well. Uh, and it also takes two weeks to come back. Um, and we want to help people get treated immediately because most of the time we don't wait two weeks for tests before we treat somebody for depression. We diagnose somebody, we treat them right away, and we'll only consider things like pharmacogenetics after the first treatment has failed. And the idea was that we wanted to get in before the first treatment fails to help select the first or second treatment, for example. Um, so we focused entirely on clinical and demographic features, stuff that a patient can answer in a questionnaire in the waiting room, whether it be virtual or real, um, before their appointment with their doctor, um, they go in and the, the results are ready for you immediately. No waiting time, no need for a complicated or expensive test that a patient might find uncomfortable or expensive or that would take time out of their day. So I'd have him answer a simple questionnaire. I believe my screen is frozen. There it is, okay. Um, he sees this. Simple questionnaire, pretty user interface. We have an even prettier one that's coming. And then I get results. My results are uh, basically the different treatments that are available. Right now we're focusing on medication, not because we don't like psychotherapy. I love psychotherapy. It's just really hard to get data for psychotherapy because most of the studies are old or small um, and don't exist in nice fancy databases because there was nobody with any money to put them in nice fancy databases. Whereas there's lots of money in drugs and people had money to put data and nice fancy databases for drugs. So we're working on getting more psychotherapy data, but right now what we have data for is medications. Um, by no desire of our own, it just is how we can start because of what's available. Um, we, uh, we produce uh, so information about different treatments. Um, we have uh, some information for the doctor that they might find useful, like the usual doses and the dose ranges. Because a lot of the time, the reason that the treatments don't work is because doctors, especially family doctors, don't dose them well enough. They don't push the dose appropriately. They don't change the dose uh, fast enough. And they don't switch to other treatments uh, quick enough if, if, they're, if the first one isn't working. Um, and then on top of that, we layer um, our probabilities of remission. So basically, it's a little number here. It's hard to see on the screen. Um, but basically these little red numbers, which tell you the percent probability that a patient will get better given a specific treatment. And we produce a different number for every treatment for which we have data. So every single treatment gets its own number for every patient. So you get a personalized prediction and the clinician can use that to make decisions about which treatment might be most effective. So they'll pick something. Um, and uh, then we track symptoms over time. So this is nice. This is actually a graph from a patient of mine, uh, who, which is reproduced with her permission. She gave her, her consent for this. Uh, obviously her name is not there, but uh, she gave her consent. Um, and uh, this is a graph of her, uh, of her anxiety scores over time. And this is very helpful because you can see, and the patient can see this too, um, you know, where you started, which is about moderate anxiety for this lady and where she got to, which was that she became, in, she got into remission from her anxiety. Um, and this was basically, this wasn't depression treatment, um, but this was us working on some medications that she had for anxiety and getting rid of some of them actually, and helping her understand that she was actually doing well, even though she was more, a little bit more anxious in the moment as we would reduce the dose of medication, she would look at her most recent score and see that, for example, you know, this score was a bit worse than the, store, the score the, the week before, but overall she was still better than she was when she started and that continued to improve. Um, it was also nice because all of this is on an app stored in the cloud. 
Um, and I can access this anywhere and so can the patient. So I was actually at a conference in New York when she called me uh, here actually. Uh, and she asked me, you know, I, I'm feeling anxious, what's going on? And I said, well, have you done your questionnaire? She said, yes, I, I looked at the questionnaire and said, okay. So what I see is that you're a bit more anxious but you're nowhere near where you were before. Um, so you're still overall, you're better, um, which is good. That, that's, that's nice to help reduce her anxiety. And it was factual. I wasn't just, you know, making that up for her. Um, but I asked her, so, so what could have been causing a transient worsening of your anxiety? And she told me that uh, her new CPAP machine for her obstructive sleep apnea wasn't working uh, very well and she wasn't sleeping well. And I was like, well, there you go. That's the reason why you're a bit more anxious today. It's not that your anxiety overall is worse. It's just, you didn't sleep well last night. And so that's what it is. Um, and this was really helpful in helping her track um, her progress over time. And she really liked that. And a lot of patients and doctors like that particular feature as well. It's nothing fancy, it's just a graph, you know? Um, but just having that kind of information is very empowering for the patient as well. Um, so in terms of, uh, of progress, well, what have we done so far? We were founded in 2017, um, which is not that long ago. Um, we launched our own AI platform um, so that we uh, could have a, a tool that is specific uh, to working with psychiatric data sets. Um, that have particular quirks like every data set does. Every data, you know, from different fields, every data, every field has its own little quirks and we wanted something that worked well with ours. Um, we published an ethical framework that guides our work called meticulous transparency, which basically governs how we think about uh, deploying our existing and new uh, products in the future. We built um, um, uh, an MVP, a minimum viable product, basically a very functional demo version of the product that we were able to get into clinics and get some initial ideas. We were able to launch our personalized AI model that I showed you a bit about, and we've been continuously updating that since. Um, and um, that model actually is interesting because it becomes a medical device at that point, which means you have to go through regulated clinical trials with the FDA and Health Canada before you're able to uh, sell it or, or even give it to people for free outside of a clinical trial. So we've been doing clinical trials um, we've um, been uh, running, we ran a simulation center study at the end of 2019, uh, the first paper of which we published recently, and the second one is on the way. Um, and basically that was showing, you know, the effect of this kind of tool and having a third person, which is an artificial intelligence in the room with the doctor and the patient. Um, we recently finished, like two months ago, a feasibility study with the actual AI tool in clinics with uh, patients and physicians are the first time ever that a patient was treated with this kind of AI model in the world that we know of um, was very exciting. Um, and we're analyzing the data from that now. That really was just intended to show that we can do this in clinic without everybody, you know, losing their minds. Uh, no one lost their minds. It was great. People seemed uh, fairly happy overall. Um, and uh, that means that we can actually run the next study, which is going to be a very big clinical trial of like 350 patients aimed at um, uh, determining whether or not this tool makes a difference in clinic. Um, we have suspicions that it should based off of how it performs in the lab, but obviously, you know, um, uh, man plans and people plan rather and science laughs uh, to adjust the phrase a bit. Um, so we've been planning for this and uh, we'll see, we'll see if the science shakes out, but uh, my fingers are crossed that it will. Um, so in the simulation center study, um, majority of doctors uh, actually uh, trusted the tool to help them make decisions um, and um, the whether or not clinicians actually used the, the, the model predictions in their fake scenarios with fake patients was predicted by how sick the patient was and the trust in the model. There was an interaction between these two. So the sicker your patient is and the more trust you had in the AI, the more likely you are to use uh, the, uh, the decisions, uh, the, the information that it gives you, or at least to give the appearance of using it because you're, you're, what you suggested correlated with what the model suggested. 90% um, of, uh, of clinicians noted that they would want to use it with, uh, with their patients, at least those who are most in need. So 50% said they would use it with everybody and about another 40% said they would use it at least with sick patients. Um, and um, preliminary data from our feasibility study, like I said, has shown that patients and clinicians can use it in real practice uh, and they can do this without significantly increasing appointment length. So why appointment lengths? I mean, the first question we got from doctors 
when we uh, started showing people the tool was, is this gonna make my sessions longer? Because people already don't have enough time uh, to see patients and anything that's going to take more time and cause sessions to be longer, what that really probably means is sessions won't get longer. It'll just take you know time away from the patient um, or the session will get longer and the doctor will be able to see less patients. So we actually measured session lengths um, and measured relationship between physician and patient. There are scales for that to see if implementing this tool in real practice had any negative effects on the relationship um, or had any negative effects in terms of increasing the length of time. So far, it doesn't look like it. We haven't finished the analysis yet, but preliminary uh, results by looking at it and doing some basic ANOVAs, um, it's, it looks like appointment lengths aren't changing and that overall patients seem fairly happy with, uh, with the tool and have either felt that it improved or did not change their relationship with their doctor. Um, this all was happening, by the way, during COVID-19. So we were actually, st we started the study. We had our first patient use the AI two days before the first lockdown last March. Um, I was actually physically present for that first patient. I was very excited um, because it was the first time uh, that, uh, that it happened. Um, so I was really happy that happened. And two days later we locked down and we had to make the entire study virtual, which this is a study for regulatory reasons where we had a bunch of things still on paper, despite the fact that we're an AI company. Uh, it's just easier because people ask less questions when there's things on paper because of security and privacy and things. Um, so we still had a bunch of things on paper. We had to change the whole thing to a virtual study like overnight. It was kind of nuts, but we did it and we finished it uh, in times of COVID. Um, and even though that had some interesting effects on you know, how responsive our doctors were because they were so busy sort of figuring out their own practices, we were still able to finish the study. Um, so we were happy about that. Um, eventually we'll expand to other conditions uh, such as anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, uh, and maybe uh, substance use and other things in the future with the hope of one day sort of forgetting about diagnosis entirely and just looking at people and looking at potential treatment plans that will help them. But that's a long ways off. Uh, it requires having all the data together. And the idea is to scale globally um, and of course validating our algorithm with each different population that we apply it to to make sure that it's ethical. Um, but with the intent of helping millions of people uh, reduce uh, their suffering. So thank you for listening, um, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. David Benro. Um, yeah, the floor is open to any to any questions. Feel free to just write them in the chat, or you can message uh, one of us privately as well if you would like. Or you could like just ask. Are they allowed to do that? Also, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, you should be able to, I believe, unmute yourselves and ask if you have any questions. Yeah, hi, um, my name is David. I have a brief question about also the patient and uh, I guess the therapeutic relationship. Like how often did the patients meet with the therapist slash uh, psychiatrist? Good question. So this, so the original intent of the study was that we would have the patient and the doctor meet five times over uh, three to five months, which is a fairly reasonable uh, sequence uh, to meet your doctor for depression treatment. Um, what we were able to get was three, uh, which is good because the, one of the people on the steering committee for the study told me, you're lucky if you get two. Um, so what we got was three. Every patient had at least three visits who finished the study. Three people withdrew. Uh, before they had their first visit with the AI. Um, uh, and uh, that was because they didn't have time or COVID-19 and we just didn't want to be in a study at that time. Um, they hadn't actually been exposed to the AI with the doctor yet, but they had, a, they had, had two of them had had the uh, accounts with the app. Um, but anyways, for the people who finished the study, all of them had at least three visits. Some had, one had four, um, no, sorry, one had five and a few had, uh, three, two others had three, I think. Um, so three visits, one of which was without the tool because we wanted a baseline and two of which were with the tool where we would measure the appointment length. Um, okay. And this okay. is despite the fact that we really, really tried to get people to meet their doctors quickly uh, and, and rapidly, but doctors will do what they do. It was a feasibility study. So we didn't really have 
the capacity to force people to to follow the appointment schedule. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in any like therapy relationship, the patient doesn't show up, but they just don't show up. Oh, it wasn't um, the patient. The patients oh. wanted to be seen. It was the doctors who didn't have. To. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, gotcha. yeah, it was the opposite. It's the opposite. But th but that's very realistic. It's very real world. Um, most of the time, family doctors and psychiatrists can't necessarily see their patients at the the one month or two week intervals you're supposed to see them at, even though the app told them every single time, please see your patients in two weeks. Um, we got what we could. Um, so yeah, um, some of these patients also had therapists that they saw weekly as a separate sort of thing, but we were measuring to see if having the AI in the session with your doctor, um, were, to, were is going to sort of have a negative effect on your relationship with your, with your clinician. Um, so we're not necessarily looking at whether or not it improved a therapeutic relationship, uh, which is a sort of a separate question we've had to measure the beginning and the end. Um, here we only measured uh, the overall strength of the relationship at the end to see, because some of these patients had known their doctors for a long time and some were new, so it wouldn't have been a fair comparison. And it was a very small number, so we couldn't control for it. So it wasn't worth measuring at the beginning. Um, but we have measures at the end and we have the overall impression of the patient and the physician about whether or not this had a negative effect on their relationship with their patient. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good question, though. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe if I may ask a question as well, do you foresee this tool complementing a doctor's role or more replacing and helping them like improve their like their role, like replacing them? So the 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 explicit um, objective is not to replace doctors um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, the AI can only know what it knows. Um, which is limited by the data that's available, which is limited by what people decide to collect in data sets, which is limited by what people are looking for in those original studies. Um, AI isn't smart enough yet to replace doctors. It just isn't in any subfield of medicine. Um, it can't do global understanding of people. It can answer specific questions. So it's able to help make the specific prediction about which of a number of treatments might be most useful for this patient given all these characteristics. And we do include as much as we can. So we include a lot about uh, demographics and, 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 and as many social measures as, 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 as are available in the data, how many people you live with, uh, how supported you feel, et cetera, um, in addition to symptoms. Um, but it's nowhere near good enough to replace a clinician. Um, it also doesn't do a lot of the things clinicians will do. It doesn't educate the patient. Um, it doesn't uh, discuss treatment with the patient. It doesn't provide medical advice to the patient. It doesn't, it doesn't do 99% of things that doctors do and that, do, they, that they do well. What it does is it, does the, it, 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 it helps clinicians with the one thing they're bad at. Well, not the one thing. We're bad at a lot of things. But one of the things that we're bad at, which is predicting treatment effectiveness. Um, but... Once, we've, once you pick a molecule, there's a hundred other things that have to get done before the patient you know, pops the pill in their mouth or goes to the therapist. Um, and all of those other things doctors have to do and only doctors can do. And even making that decision about the treatment requires taking into account things that the AI may not again have access to um, that we tell doctors and remind them to check because um, the AI doesn't have access to it. So we remind them, please remember to check this because we don't for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so we've always been about making very specific recommendations um, in very specific situations where clinicians are already not good at making those decisions alone. Um, yeah, so no, we're not planning to replace doctors. That would be silly and also probably illegal. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience at this time? Uh, I have a quick follow-up question um, sure. on how often, like for example, you were showing the CAD seven. Like, how often did the patients uh, fill out the questionnaire? Good question. Just, so we're, yeah. we're actually running that analysis right now. Um, so I don't have an actual number for you yet. We sent it the GAT seven and the PHQ nine every week. 
Um, it looks like, depending on how you count it, and again, because, the, because of the pandemic, things dragged on for a bit longer for most patients than they should have in, in the study. Um, but if you look at the first three months, or at least the first three months worth of questionnaires they should have completed, but we haven't actually looked at it with missing questionnaires. We're just looking at the first 12 uh, potential, uh, the first 12 answered. It looks like we're getting somewhere between in the 50s to mid 60s percent of people completing every questionnaire. Um, assuming that you, you ignore the people who got better and who didn't need to answer them anymore, um, but counting their rate up until they got better kind of thing. Um, and we only had three people out of 17 drop out of the study overall. So dropout rates for studies in apps are about 50% when corrected for bias. So we're definitely doing well in that, in that standpoint. And we're definitely having you know, patients complete questionnaires most of the time, it's not 100%, it wasn't kind of expected to be. What we were hoping to see was about two thirds of the time, I think we're, we're gonna just miss that, maybe, we'll see, I haven't finished the analysis yet, um, which is still fine, because it's a small number and uh, we were splitting it between uh, psychiatrists who had sicker patients who were less reliable to fill out questionnaires and family doctors who were. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think, around there somewhere, but definitely much more than half the time, um, which is already pretty good compared to the to literature. And I'm, when we're talking about over months, because most of the time you see uh, dropout rates of like 50% in apps after a few weeks kind of thing. So people were using it for months, which is good. I don't have a clear answer for you. It'll be in the paper. Uh, okay, okay, cool. What's interesting though, is like, it's clear that there are some patients who always answer all of their questionnaires and some patients who don't. So it's not really a, a general effect. It's very much a within patient effect of some people are either because, and we're gonna see why, either because they're sicker or because um, they just like apps less or whatever it is. Um, there's gonna be some factor that explains it. Do less and other people do more. It's not like we have a bunch of you know, patchy, equally patchy data. It seems like we have some very clear people who answer every single week and people who are like, who like answer and then drop off. And I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some people who have like patches, we'll see. So there's the subgrouping that can be done, which is by itself is interesting. But again, we have 13 people, uh, 14 people. So it's not um, gonna be enough to do very advanced analyses, unfortunately. But for the one, one thing I can say is for the purposes of the, for the, the questionnaires that you needed to complete specifically for the AI to work and not just the weekly questionnaires, but like the one-time questionnaires that you needed to complete, we had an 86% completion rate. So only two patients didn't complete all of their questionnaires before their first visit with their doctor um, that they needed to complete to have the AI work. So that's nice. That's, that shows that those questionnaires at least are pretty um, uh, feasible for patients to get done before they meet their doctor just to get the AI to work, um, which is good. Yeah. If there are no more questions, then um, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for your My presentation pleasure. again today. Uh, the next two workshops will be the Kids Help Phone workshop and the Jack.org workshop. The Zoom links can be found in the package. So we look forward to seeing you there.